Hello and welcome. I'm your host Petri, and this show helps you to build your company. Have you already seen The Social Dilemma on Netflix? In this episode, I talk with Bailey Richardson, who was interviewed in the movie. We talk about community building, Instagram's early days, and the appeal of voice apps and passion economy. Let's tune in. Hey Bailey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm pretty good. And uh, it's so awesome that you're in my show because you're just the latest uh, movie star. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm having my, what I assume will be my only movie star moment of my at- entire life. I've, I think this is, this is as much as I want to do, but this last two weeks has, has been my movie star moment. <laughs> I think you're getting just uh, started. You know, maybe there are already some other people casting you into the things you don't even know about yet. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm hoping to be in a superhero film at some point. So maybe that's my step up from this uh, internet documentary straight into Wonder Woman. I'm putting it out there right now. Someone please, please select me. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will compete for the position. So what is the social dilemma? Oh, well, I can tell you what the film is, but are you asking the bigger question? You can, you can take the answer whichever way you like. <laughs> um, well, I'll take it. I'll take it maybe the most straightforward way, which is uh, this film just came out called The Social Dilemma that I was a part of um, for, I was interviewed for about, I guess, a year and a half ago. Um, and the backstory is that the the director is a guy named Jeff Orlowski, who went to the same university as I did. And my advisor, my freshman advisor, messaged me a while ago and, and really encouraged me to talk to him because she she really liked him and appreciated his work. And so I, I spoke to Jeff and his team and I really liked him. And he told me that he was working with Tristan Harris and a number of other people in tech to make a film about um, how to make tech more ethical and, and the state of social media. And he had read an article that I was in in the Washington Post just about a year and I guess maybe more about two years ago, that was about my decision. I, I deleted my Instagram account and uh, a reporter found out about it. And I spoke out um, sort of about my relationship, my personal relationship to Instagram and that decision in the article. And he had seen that and, and sort of asked me if I wanted to be involved in the film. And and I was just explaining off air that I have, I've never done an experience of a major film before. So, you know, it's very, very new to me. But I, I was interviewed for two hours. You know, there were like three cameras on me. They set up a whole set for it. And, and at the time when you're doing that big, big period of, of interviewing, you know, you might not, we, I didn't know where the film would go, what it would look like. And um, kind of slowly it went to Sundance and then I found out it was going to be on Netflix. And all the way through, I sort of thought maybe, maybe no one would really watch it. Uh, I th- I've found being in technology that there's a pretty limited number of people that care about tech outside of their personal experience of it. So, you know, things like Facebook and Instagram, people care about their lives on there, but I don't usually think that the general world population cares about industry news or industry critique, but it, it has just been a huge film. I think for a number of reasons, one of which is we're all stuck inside and maybe Netflix is just extremely powerful right now, but uh, lots of people have seen it. It was like the number four film um, in the US and the number three film in India. And so it's just been way more popular and distributed than I expected it to. And we were joking because I think I'm in the film for like, you know, seven seconds, including the trailer. (laughs) So it's just a funny, funny experience of, of, of kind of just having that relationship to a film where it's just your, you know, you're just sat in a room in front of a camera. But, but I think when something gets put up on Netflix or made into a a film, it, it has weight to it and, and people relate to relate to that in some kind of very special way. Um, So yeah, anyway, it's a film about social media and how it shows up in our lives today and how it's affecting society and how people connect to each other. Um, And we we can talk about that more if you want to, but you can also, you know, a lot of people are talking about that and, and kind of going back and forth on the internet right now about what they got right and, and what they didn't get right. Well, that's one thing to think about, you know, what happened before. Obviously, you were one of the first ones in Instagram, uh, the, within the first 10 or first 13 uh, employees in the, in the company. So you were really figuring out social media. I think Instagram was probably the first one really getting to the mobile and, and you know, sort of genuine mm mobile app, social app. Others were Facebooks and others were just converting and they came later. 
What do you think? What is the next one? I think that's more interesting. TikTok mm. is already old news. <laughs> What's going to happen in the, in the next 10 years? You know, what, what is the thing? Now we are in uh, 2020 and, mm. and 2010 was just 10 years ago. So, so there's probably something new coming up. Yeah. And, and people are so sort of tired of, if you've been deleting Instagram and do you actually know how many people from the documentary don't have their, you know, their personal uh, accounts? I'm not sure. Um, I do know that, you know, there's this trend of a lot of them not not letting their kids use uh, Instagram or social media. Um, and I know anecdotally that a large number of the original 13 employees, including the two founders of Instagram, really don't use their account very much, their own. Um, so I don't know. I think there's something about these things that maybe there's like a line with usage of, you know, Maybe there's like a light, almost addiction where you use it kind of regularly. But when you work on the products, when they're like what you're thinking about all day, you know, or even like kind of cruising through or testing on your, you know, like on all these mobile devices these engineers would have on their 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 desks testing, making sure these apps work, you just you just get so deep into it. And and I think I I was on it so much because I worked on it that I was happy to be off of it you know when I wasn't at work I, I wasn't on those things so I think it's it's pretty common for people to to intentionally have to like figure out at some point you know if you work on social media that you need to you need to build a boundary between yourself and those spaces um, and I think some of it is maybe philosophical you know some people think it's not good for them although I think some of the science is is inconclusive on that um, but I think some of it's just like, I, you know, I spend enough time in a digital format in a digital interface. And, and when I'm not at work, I'm, I'm going to not do that. And I need boundaries to get there. Let's get to the amazing, uh, Instagram stories a bit later, but how about building some communities first? Great. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So this year has been a bit weird. Mm. Is this the weirdest year ever? at least in our generation. Um, a lot of people need to go online. A lot of startups need to figure out how to reach their audience, mm. how, to, how to do sales and marketing nowadays. Can a startup growth company build a community or is it just a fancy word uh, for just the regular customers? Mm. Yeah, well, I can tell you what I think. I mean, I, I, I in the last 30 years, since the internet has you know, increasingly become a part of every everyone's life or most people's lives. I think it's really changed how we relate to the word community. When I interview people, for context, I've interviewed just tons of people who organize communities and, and end up talking to everyday people about community that I just happen to meet because, you know, it's what I focus on professionally. And when I talk to people who are over the age of, you know, like 60 or 65, the word community to them is very physical. It's like the town they live in or their neighborhood or uh, the church that they go to or where they practice something spiritually. And because of the internet, we're able to connect to each other uh, about a passion at in a different way, in a non-geographically limited way. And I think that's like, you know, people who follow follow the world <laughs> get that innately. But I find that a byproduct of that has been that people are using the word community in a pretty non-specific way. We sort of detached the word from our physical location and, and we're trying to like land it again. And there are different people with different takes on this, you know, is, is basically an audience, a community is, is a user base, a community. And, and for me, it's not. Um, and, and I think this is a, a an unfolding argument that is is still in the midst of being played out but you know if i take a side for me i feel like a community is a group of people that face each other instead of face the, the stage as it were so it's it's people who are actually connecting to each other instead of just to a public figure or a brand or an organization or a product that they appreciate you know they're not facing the stage they're facing each other or they're able to interact with each other somewhat regularly um and and so I think it's important to have uh, a line in the sand there for 
what is a community. And, and to me, it's people who keep coming together over something they care about. It's not just, you know, any passive group. It, it's a group that actually engages with each other. So, so just in terms of definition, I think, you know, I, I'm not talking about community as just another term for your social media following or, you know, an audience <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> Or an entire user base, which I think a lot of tech companies, you know, are, are using that euphemism or even just like your customer support org. I'm, I'm trying to land it in the modern evolution of, of what, you know, maybe my grandma would have thought it to be. Um, and, and I think it's, it is possible for startups to emerge from a community or emerge to serve a community or grow a community. You know, I, we talked about how I, I worked at Instagram in the early days and Instagram grew with a group of people that called themselves iPhoneographers in those early days. You know, the first users were were visualists who had new technology in their hands, uh, an iPhone 4 that had a great camera, one of the first really great cameras for uh, for smartphones. And but that was a great phone. Yeah, it was a great phone. And Instagram launched right then when all of a sudden all these designers and tech people had a camera in their hands that – could do so much more than a- any other kind of thing that we had in our pocket, you know, for the the, the whole rest of uh, the whole previous sort of world that we had lived in or previous version of human life. And so I think Instagram served that community and, and there are other in- examples out there too, but I, I hear you maybe jumping in. Yeah, I'm just eager to ask the two questions. You know, yeah, they yeah. are so trivial and so important. Hmm. Which one was first, iPhone 4 or Instagram? I mean, that was it? basically done in a way that, hey, this is an awesome phone, now we can do this thing. So was it before? And the more important question, what was the very first published picture? Oh, great questions. <laughs> well, I mean, my I'm actually like never fact-checked this, but as far as I know, um, the iPhone 4 was first or news of the iPhone 4 helped drive Instagram's product. So Kevin and Mike who started it knew that the camera was better. And, and they knew that the hardware everyone was using was going to improve. And that was part of why they included photos in the product. Um, and the very first picture is is a picture. That, there's a couple of complications to it um, because there was this – one of the reasons Instagram, I think, was so great was everyone who was in the beta w- w- talks about it like it was such a special beta experience, which I, I, I've never really heard – anyone say that uh, in any other context, but the beta app was called Bourbon and the company actually was called Bourbon Inc. until it was acquired by Facebook. And I wonder when it was sort of, you know, established, what was the establishment? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. No, Kevin and Mike, I think were just cocktail nerds back in the day, but um, this, this app was actually a location based product to start with. They thought maybe locations was sort of the center of it. And one of the early users actually became an early engineer, a guy named Gregor Hockmuth. And Greg was a photographer. His his dad was a filmmaker and also an engineer. And he was using different apps that, that had filters for your photos when he would upload his locations on Bourbon. And Kevin, the founder's girlfriend, Nicole, saw Greg's pictures and was like, why don't you make more of the pictures like that? Like Greg's, I like those. And so Kevin, the founder, decided to write code that made filters. And he took the first photo in the beta with those signature Instagram filters in Todo Santos, Mexico, I believe, while on vacation of his flip-flop. It, and I, <laughs> I know what the photo looks like. And if you Google it, you can find it. I think if you scroll far enough back in on, on Kevin's account, you can find <laughs> it. But it's a pretty uninspiring photo, in my opinion. Like, Kevin's not a bad photographer, but, you know, nobody needs to look at a regular dude's flip-flop. When you started in Instagram, you were also checking what's been done before, and YouTube was one of them. It was, you know, early days of YouTube, obviously as well. So, what did you learn from YouTube, and what did YouTube do differently, or Instagram did differently? Because you you came a bit late on, obviously, the use case was a bit different. Yeah, you know, I mean, I actually think I've studied YouTube since since working at Instagram, um, but if the biggest reference points that we had at the time. I'd say the biggest kind of piece of inspiration was lightly Tumblr, but mostly Flickr. A lot of the people who were early Instagram suggested users had been like the younger people in the wave of Flickr photo sharing. 
And I'm not so sure. Flickr was like a different product, you know, and they didn't go mobile and and people would, I mean, they have now, but not super successfully. Um, but they, they have people who are really passionate about photography and sharing their photography publicly. Um, yeah, it's more like pro thing. It, it was not like casual photos. It was more like... Yeah, it was intentional. Yeah. yeah. A- and, and, you know, they make them available to other people publicly, which public photo sharing was a big thing that Instagram decided to do that a lot of investors said would never work. Um, but that decision to, you know, I actually want to share publicly was like a key insight and a key bet. And Flickr had done that years before. And and they had seen a community emerge. And there are people like a user Pei Ketron and a user Chris Connolly and a bunch of the folks that really set the tone in the early days of Instagram had been in the Flickr community and had had meetups with other photographers that they liked and followed and created online relationships with each other. And I, I actually think that more than anything, our users like taught us, those people who had been a part of the early Flickr community, they they led creating such a generous and warm place on Instagram. Um, and and this culture of like meeting up with each other and and supporting each other and giving each other creative feedback. Um, which I think you can do in photography, you know, about the composition or the lighting or whatever. So so I think we we learned a lot from from Flickr in terms of just cre- creative sharing, you know, and that creativity. And, and certainly YouTube early, there were decisions that they made that were quite similar to the ones that, that we made, which were about curating and elevating great content on the site. Uh, YouTube, you know, if you, if you sort of find the dregs of YouTube, uh, this content can be pretty bad. And I don't necessarily mean like offensive or like political. I mean, just like low quality. Yeah, the, the devices were not awesome at the time, you know, or iPhone, was it three at the time or whatever? I don't even remember. What, yeah. What, how could you actually make videos at the time? Yeah. I mean, the quality was low and and also making a video is just hard. It's much harder than making a good photograph. You know, you have to edit yeah. it together. There's a lot of elements. And this woman, Mia Qualiarello, um, who actually now helps interview for our podcast. She's a correspondent on our podcast. Um, but she was the first community manager at, at, at YouTube. And community for them meant some part support, but mostly editorial, which is what it meant for Instagram too. And her job was to feature really great use cases on YouTube, use cases that illuminated what was possible on the platform outside of just like sort of the pedestrian or average content. And, you know, to, to make sure that when people came to YouTube, they found things that were entertaining or interesting. And, and that was a lot of what we did on Instagram was setting the tone and also expanding what people thought was possible or what was, uh, you know, available on this little app by curating it and by intentionally looking through the platform to find the most interesting use cases and, and to elevate them. So I think that was something that YouTube did very early on and and that we absolutely followed. There's so many things actually there. I, I probably start to, my, my buffer is overloading, uh, but <laughs> just sort of summarizing and trying to sort of uh, pick the, the golden nuggets from here so that you know other people can build communities mm. as well and maybe businesses. So first you put some, uh, or, or some passionate people come together for whatever, for whatever reason, photographer or you know, whatever the common cause which sort of puts them together. And then they start to do things together. And, and then if you're building a product, which is helping them in some way or form, then you just observing what they're doing and you sort of pick up, great. You're not sort of telling that, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be done. This is the way we be designed it. You, you listen to community. Do you let the community to drive the sort of the direction of the product as well? Yeah. How much? How much you did you sort of say that no we don't want to go that direction we we actually mm-hmm. want to go that way because there's whatever you know business reasons to go that way yeah yeah I think there was some of both you know and this is where I give a lot of the credit to the product team our team was like sort of like you know I heard the, the I'm stealing this from SoundCloud's first community manager a guy named David Noel he described his job as being the sponge that absorbed all the water from users out in the world. <laughs> and then he had to squeeze the water back to the product teams. And 
that was some of what we did, you know, and, and noticing there were times when too much time would pass before we had worked on creative tools and the filters weren't getting used or other filter apps were getting popular and, you know, kind of surfacing that insight back to the product teams and letting them, letting them decide whether or not it's a priority. And, and there are decisions throughout Instagram's, Instagram's life um, where we did do something that the community wanted and there are examples where we didn't. Uh, I think one one big example is is regramming, like the decision to not build that into the product. Kevin and Mike had a really strong perspective that, you know, you should be sharing your photos from your life or like photos that you've chosen to post instead of just kind of putting things on your own profile that are from other people. And they could have generated a lot more content early if they had let people regram, but they never put that in the product. And that was something a lot of people were doing by going into other apps and figuring out how to do it. But it just wasn't the top priority for Instagram, nor was it, you know, the vision of of the space and experience that the product team thought would be the most meaningful to people. So I think there's there's a little bit of both, you know, there's there's some of of these problems that we see people running into and, and we can solve. Another example is like the ability to delete your own comments. So if someone comments something on your own photo and and you don't like it, you can remove it. Um, that's something like that, you know, I think the community team is really aware of and can bring back to the product team. But there are other things that the product team decides isn't isn't right for the direction the company's going in. Thinking Instagram, I think it has quite distinct values. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the original Instagram and probably not into Facebook time so much, but, you know, it's it's quite sort of family friendly and, and you know, nice in, in the values considered to form more, more like a lesser fair Twitter. Mm. Uh, was that intentional in the beginning? And, and so if, if you start to see that, you know, we don't want to have that type of community, we want to be more you mm. know, friendly or something, you know, what are the ways to guide and try to get the right type of people to the community. Yeah. Well, I think the the number one way to create a culture is to set a standard. So, you know, I one of my favorite quotes is the standard you walk by is the standard you accept. And kind of when someone comes into a new room, like a dinner party or a new room online, they, you know, we pay attention to social dynamics and and what is being featured or, you know, the the way people are interacting and and we absorb those and, and we replicate them. And for us, we had some tools to set the standard that people would walk past. Uh, and and one of them was we had this uh, suggested user list in the early days. Um and often on the internet up until that point, a lot of people who were suggested users on like Twitter, for example, were just famous people. So it was just like people you might know. And it's kind of like a growth tactic. Like we need to just get content in your feed, follow these people, Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber, whatever. But on Instagram, we handpicked those suggested users for probably three or four years, every week, every two weeks. Or was it you who handpicked them? Me and then, you know, <laughs> some previous people before I had joined put the first list together and then I did it for a long time. And then we started building a team where we had, you know, a, a, a woman who worked in Brazil, a woman who worked in Japan, you know, people around the world who could do that for their own countries and cultures. Um, but when you signed up for Instagram, you would you would get some suggestions of people to follow. Um, there were people in your contact book and then it was people who were suggested. And that would be people that we found who were taking their own photographs, mobile photos was a, was a requirement. If you were just finding other photos or using a DSLR, we didn't feature you because it just wasn't, it was confusing to new users. Like how did they do that? <laughs> Most people were going to just be using their mobile phones and we wanted to show them you know, kind of what not totally unreachable quality content was, but what what interesting quality content was in terms of like mobile photography. Um, so we would find all these different people all around the world. Like there was a man who rode around the world from, rode, rode off on his bike in London and cycled completely around the world and shared his story on Instagram. There was a, a man in the Air Force Reserve who was in charge of 
refueling planes and he would take pictures from his mobile phone laying on his stomach looking out the window as the beam of a of a of a plane with fuel would attach to a fighter jet there was a guy who um was a monk early in Nepal who was taking photos on Instagram there's so many different creative use cases and and we our team was in charge of putting those people forward with what's possible and, and that that some level of creativity and thoughtfulness in your content mobile content was was what Instagram was about and it was also part of what we did was we would see did these people that we were suggesting or we were going to put on the suggested user list did they respond to their comments were they kind were they warm <laughs> At the time, there were a lot of other places on the internet, including YouTube, which the comments, it was like a joke. They were so dark. <laughs> People were so mean to each other. And Instagram was a very friendly place in the beginning. And I think some of that was because, like I said, the standard you walk by is the standard you accept. And we were really intentional about the first experiences people had on Instagram and who they followed and and what was elevated as as what the, the platform celebrated. So you're saying as well that... Um... People were also observing how do you should respond because obviously those people were also being YouTube and maybe they were giving some nastier comments there. But then, then they look around and see that, well, Instagram doesn't really work that way. So I, maybe I just have to use more kind of words here. Yeah, and I think it groundswells. You know, when the people who are who have a big following treat you kindly, that that sort of like shows you that's that's how I I should be acting back. So I think, yeah, that that people are pretty socially attuned, maybe more so than we give them credit for. Like they don't understand the ins and outs of product development, but people are pretty socially self-aware and aware of the spaces that they're in. Um, at least I, I believe that. So when you joined Instagram, uh, Instagram suggested you some famous people. So it was not just that you have some content to look, but it was also sort of setting the tone for the for your experience of what to expect and how to behave? Or was that sort of a, just a consequence? Or you just realized it a bit later? Or was it sort of intentional that you you want to show the good role models before yeah. you start to push your own content and, and ways to do things? Yeah, no, it was 100% intentional. And it was intentional all the way from the beta group. And before I worked there, Kevin and Mike were very intentional about who their first users were. Because I think, you know, there's two words in social media. One is social and one is media. <laughs> and I think Instagram in the very early days felt as fresh as maybe like MTV did in the early 90s or late 80s. It was just different. The content was different. It was fresh. It was exciting. It was unique. And, you know, I think that's one of the challenges for whatever's next, whatever. There might be many things that are next, but... It, you know, people need to feel like this is fresh and exciting and new and different. And at the time, you know, other social media platforms, people, Twitter, there weren't really pictures. And on Facebook, it was a lot of pretty like low quality, very personal photos, you know, me with my friends doing something, like standing in front of a view. And and Instagram was more about people's interests, had an art, artistic aesthetic bent to it. And I think the quality of the photos were higher. And so we knew that There was also just something about people realizing this is a new and exciting place uh, that that could be only communicated if the people you saw when you logged in, the content you saw when you logged in, was was new and fresh. So it was it was very intentional. All of these things were were very intentional. Who we put in front of new users and and why. And I think one thing I see in in people who are building platforms and building you know social media spaces or spaces that are aspire to be social is oftentimes almost the science of acquisition is is so uh sort of just well discussed how to make build virality into your product how to acquire new users make embed codes we you know make a web version we make it postable to other platforms and you know vcs are like breathing down founders necks trying to see numbers that are like kind of just like how many people are in the platform. Although I know think savvy VCs look at their engagement levels, but I, I often see people just go straight to acquisition and straight to new users and just trying to pour new people in. And with a social platform, if you don't have engagement, if you don't have a quality base of content and people creating that content to start with, 
you're going to have a leaky bucket. You know, new users are going to come in and they're they're not there's not going to be anything for them. And so I think you have to grow more slowly than I think many people want to. You have to you have to create a culture and set a tone with a small group of people before you just start pouring new people into the space. Is there kind of a critical mass? How many people do you need to get to have a strong community starting with after which you can start to grow it more scaled basically the community? Is there many any numbers or can can you give some kind of guidelines that when it's time to crank up a bit and, and not yeah. sort of great? It probably, I mean, I'm sure it depends on the product you're making. So maybe something like Instagram with a single feed versus like Quora with all these different question and answers. It's probably different answers for different people, but Paul Graham has a good arbitrary number, which I'll just use here. And I use with with a lot of people because I think sometimes you just need to set goals and run at them. Uh, he says, get a hundred people who love your product, like who really love it. Like focus more on that than the total number of people. Like if you have a spreadsheet of names of a hundred people who love your product, that is your first goal as a founder, like love it. And that, that I think is, is what I tell people to do. A hundred of the users that you want who love your product, that is the first step. And it's not step number 10. That's you'd have a different, different, you know, at a later stage of your company, you'll have different numbers and you'll have different goals but you can't skip step one, which is get a hundred people who love it. Do you start to create, or I don't know, pick somehow um, nurture leaders, new leaders to, because obviously you cannot do all the things by yourself and, and you should not do things for people. You, I, I read the book. It's a really good book. Everybody should read. Oh, thank your, your you. Book. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, how do you do that in a, in a proper way? Because, uh, like you mentioned, uh, in Instagram cases, uh, in, in case you know, you you had people pretty much in all the all the different nations, you know, knowing the local lo- local people and how to start to build the communities in in those places. So, yeah, I think you need to have some understanding of your business opportunity. So, where where do you want to go next? You know, what where it's the next stage of this thing, and and what community do you need to grow in order to get there? So in the Instagram case, when we launched Android, um, we we didn't have many users in Brazil or Korea at that time because it's such Android-heavy countries. In, in Instagram's case, in terms of developing new leaders, we knew when we were launching Android that people were going to join in countries like Brazil and in Korea where Android was really strong. And when they joined, we needed to have people to show them in a suggested user list who spoke their language and who photographed the cities they lived in. And so I spent a lot of time looking for people who are already on Instagram using iOS in Korea and Brazil to feature for our Android launch in the signup flow. And so I think thinking about you know the way we describe in our book, no matter what community, you're trying to build or cultivate, whether it's a digital one, whether it's an in-person one. If you want to grow the community, the, the the key to growing a community isn't management, it's cultivating leaders, new leaders. And when you're cultivating new leaders, you want to look for two things. One is, are they genuine? Are they showing up because they really believe in the purpose of the community, whether it's spreading creativity or emotional support or fandom, you know, are they, are they sincere in that connection to the community's purpose? And then are they qualified? Are they able to do what you might ask of them in that sort of leadership role? So, you know, for Instagram in a very straightforward way, that was, could they take quality pictures and were they regularly contributing? But for a a chapter based community or a physical community. Like we spoke to a woman um, in our research who started something called the Queer Soup Night, which is an event-based fundraiser that happens like once a month at pre-COVID times in New York where a queer chef makes a soup and then people come and it's donation only and all the money gets directed towards one nonprofit each session. And she got all these new chapters that wanted to open a Queer Soup Night in Portland, a Queer Soup Night in Gainesville, and she makes sure that the founding teams, their version of qualification is they need to have a background in cooking and a background in event production. Because if they don't have those things, they're not going to be able to put on these events. So if you're at a stage where you're thinking about trying to grow a community, 
look for people out there who have already showed up if possible or are connected to your brand or your business. And depending on your business opportunity, try to figure out if they're genuine and qualified in their ability to to do what you're asking of them. Is it actually possible to build purely a digital community? I mean that, you know, often we want to meet people, you know, in, in, in real life, IRL. But, you know, nowadays it's maybe not even possible. So it's it's a bit more low bandwidth, if you will, the, 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 the communication. So obviously there's a lot of Discord groups. There's a lot of different uh, yeah. Reddit groups, subgroups, stuff like that. But are there real communities in, in that sense? Is it harder or is it easier or it's just different? Yeah. What is your take? Well, I guess when I was first working in community as a profession back in like 2012, a lot of people talked about the community landscape as like, is it an online community or an offline community? And up until COVID, I think, I would say that pretty much all communities are both. Uh, There are some exceptions. There are some offline communities, maybe like basketball teams or something that maybe don't have a watering hole online where they communicate. You know, everyone's not in a WhatsApp thread or a Facebook group or something. Though increasingly, I think a lot of these offline things have some digital space where members can communicate to each other. And in terms of online communities, exactly what you said, I think that while for many online communities, they form because geographically people aren't living near each other who have a similar interest in personal finance or flying or gender politics or some, you know, physical disability or challenge that they're facing. But often you hear these stories about these online communities wanting to meet up every once in a while or members wanting to meet each other if they really develop strong relationships. So I think that both of these things are 100% possible and they both really do um, exist in the world, but both of them in pure forms. But I think increasingly you see communities want to do both, both meet up in person every once in a while and, and, and also, you know, communicate online when they don't usually meet online. But the, the trend that I'm seeing that I think is most interesting, um, is that I don't know if it makes sense to actually, do your first action to start a community offline anymore. And I'll tell you what I mean. The people that I spoke to who work at Facebook on the groups teams, they've seen so many versions of people almost like posting on Facebook for, or starting a group to see like, Hey, are there any other people out there like this? And sometimes that feedback in digital space is either clear enough that yes, there are, or no, there aren't, (laughs) that someone then can go forward with the investment in a deeper way. So it's, it's almost like, you know, the first natural thing to do these days would be to put something up on your Instagram or your Facebook or a social place and say, Hey, does anyone want to start a run club with me? Or does anybody want to talk about chronic illnesses? Or does anybody want to nerd out about Star Wars (laughs) or the latest Star Wars? And, and, and to maybe like, kind of fire the first signal online because it's sort of the most socially low risk. And, and then from there to, to possibly do things in person or to do things um, that are more physical. But I've seen a few versions of that where, you know, a choir that started in Toronto just started with a Facebook post of, Hey, does anybody want to do this? And and they get a resounding yes. And then they begin this, this choir that's an in-person choir. So I feel like, you know, the internet is maybe at its strongest in a normal world, a non-COVID world, as a place to prototype and test. You know, is there anybody else out there like me? And and, and you know, can I see that really simply and quickly with with pretty low social risk? I see a few things here which might be a bit difficult nowadays. It's, one of them is obviously the discoverability. There's so much content. There's so much stuff there. And even in your examples, there was almost like, you know, local people doing doing stuff. Obviously, maybe your friends or someone in your Facebook group, if you're still there, uh, your Facebook, you know, friends or something. So you usually reach out to the people you know. But if, you, if you're all alone and you just, oh, I don't know, the only Star Wars person or among the Star Trekkers or mm. something, so you, you need to go somewhere else. Obviously, you can go to some groups and, uh, you know, 
subreddits or something. But but I think uh, it just feels like that. The, the, you know, there's so many opportunities, and the cancel culture is the other thing. Uh, sort of related issue, but a bit, bit further on. It's so easy to start something, but actually make it to work in a bit more longer term. I don't know how quickly people usually just you know give up, but that's there's so many of these uh, groups, and 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 after a while, you know, there, there's there's nothing left. You know, it's just completely quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I think that's something that I I hope that someone works on the next place where people can find things that they're passionate about because I was pretty skewed in Instagram because I worked in it, but I felt like a lot of people were able to to meet other people who had really similar interests to them through that platform. And I think YouTube maybe still does this in some ways, but you know, there's just so much stuff on those platforms right now. And, and also there may be gobbling up all the smaller spaces, like the old forums and, and blogs where people would have connected before. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it, it, one thing that we like to say when I'm talking to people about starting a community is that it needs to come from a really personal place and talking about companies, uh, who are successful at this. I think that's, that's one reason why a lot of companies aren't successful at, at it is there, we can make decisions in our, in our business lives and our professional lives that are so strategic. Um, and, and that makes sense in that context, right? Businesses are about making money and, and surviving through making money. But I think a lot of the best, most thriving communities come from like an extremely personal place. So much so that the original organizer or founder or the person building the product and service of this specific community will stick with it enough for it to build momentum, even when no one's showing up. You know, they'll they'll keep doing it week in and week out, week in and week out, week in and week out. And just accrue that momentum over time. And if you're just giving a community, you know, two to three months to get to 10,000, whatever, you know, you have some sort of like really hard business goal, strategic business goal, you might be able to just buy, buy people who care a little bit less, but still meet that goal, you know, and, and you might want to twist and bend your approaches for doing that. But community organizing is really like an act of devotion and and rallying passionate people takes time you can't you can't really cheat code it so I, I think that that's that's one of the one of the things that makes building a community and, and building a business sometimes at odds is business priorities can shift and change and sometimes the timelines are so tight that perhaps perhaps you don't let a community breathe for long enough i've been picking a few trends and one of them is um I think this might be the decade of more like personal things. You know, it's just like personal brands. Obviously, you know, the COVID is, is putting a lot of people to do do stuff online and starting to write newsletters or just start to use their own brand uh, instead of uh, building sort of a company. Obviously, there, there could be a company behind it, but, but the idea that, you know, it's your face first, is more authentic. And uh, I think we probably are going to that direction in, you know, in the next few years. And, and the other thing which, which I was speaking, I was just thinking actually the, the, the social dilemma as well, the transactional nature of everything. And I think we're sort of getting tired of that. Yeah. Everything is sort of so transactional. There's so much of everything. It's just like you swipe up or down or left or right, mm. you know, whichever way. And there's, it never it never ends and you know it's just it's just like more and more and you just it's just continuous overload and i think we sort of want to slow down yeah more quality over quantity yeah and, and person, personalities authentic people i think is something which we are missing after the, all the plastic stuff and, and you mm. know nice filters which are evening everything out yeah i hope so i hope so i think i think both of those insights are really spot on. And, you know, I remember realizing that the top YouTube accounts and the top Instagram accounts, besides like YouTube's own channel and Instagram's own channel, which they had competitive advantages for growing, um, (laughs) those, those are all people, you know, the first brand doesn't show up until like number 50 or something, or even further down the line. And I remember noticing that and just thinking, I actually think we've been 
making a false assumption all along that people actually care like as more about brands or you know packaging things up as a brand i think it was had to do more with the the distribution channels we had for information and who could buy a billboard and who couldn't but now that media is like so accessible it's pretty clear that human beings relate to other human beings so much more powerfully than than they do to i think a a, a symbol or, or a company like in fact i think a lot of people reject brands and companies and just don't trust them at this point but I think that first insight's really right. And and I, I, I don't know where the biggest trend that I see happening in that direction is, you know, I, I heard someone once say that platforms can offer uh, fame, love, and, and money to people. And often a platform will just offer one or two of those things. But increasingly there are more platforms that offer all three. It's like three very sort of like core human instinctual like cravings <laughs> it's like fame love and money which platforms are giving uh, or providing you with love um great question because the money you know that was not in tiktok for example previously you could get mm-hmm. a lot of fame mm-hmm. maybe a bit of love from the people as well yeah but, you know money was out of the question but yeah i mean fame and money that's that's like youtube as well isn't it yeah yeah, I mean, I I think there are some corners of Facebook groups from people I've talked to, and maybe like a WhatsApp thread or certain Slack groups, um, where they don't have as many metrics about fame, <laughs> uh, where you you can actually feel sincerely connected to other people or or bonded. Um, but I think. You know, one one space that I, I'm really curious about that I think does all three of these things, that there are two platforms. One is Twitch and the other is Substack. And they're all really built, they're, they're both built around individual creators who people choose um, to follow as like a trail guide, either into, on Twitch's case, typically a video game, or in Substack's case, uh, a topic that they want to follow this writer into. And... There, there's this core kind of creator who's generating the content, most of the content, but there's all of these ways for the audience to interact with each other, which is new and exciting, and for those people to build relationships and also to connect back to the creator. And then they're also offering streamers and writers a chance to get paid, to, in Twitch's case, either get tips from their audience or get ad revenue from their content. And in Substack's case, to make to make revenue directly from their readers who appreciate these writers and what they're saying. And so I am really interested in those three models because I sort of think the promise of exposure, which is, is sort of what I think, you know, people came to Instagram, I think, for maybe love and some now maybe more for fame. <laughs> um, but the promise of exposure, I think, feels maybe a li- little bit like monopoly money. You know, it's like, okay, so I have all these followers on Twitter, but I, I, I don't know them, you know, and, and what, what does it do for me? <laughs> if, you know, unless you're Kim Kardashian or you're uh, pretty high up there, like I, I think it, it's not necessarily a secure living either. Um, and, and so I, I'm curious about people who are actually maybe going through economies of scale, able to support themselves doing their creative passion, whether it's video games or, or writing, or we'll see what, what comes next. But the, the downside of that is is exactly what you said, which I talk about in the film, which is that, damn, it really starts to feel like the entire internet is just a giant mall. And, you know, every corner is about some kind of transaction. And that that does get, I think, really tiring. <laughs> and, and it makes you hope that someone's going to come and do something, you know, radically different outside of just some of these like side projects that pop up. But I, I wish there was spaces where everything didn't feel quite so transactional so what are the places you hang out you already mentioned some of those but you know is there some emerging new digital ways of finding the new instagram mm. well I'll sp- whatever that it is yeah I mean, it's just like offline and just i don't know just drink coffee and just <laughs> get the rest yeah i definitely do get you know a lot of joy from playing sports with friends like that's my that's my pure purest space um but digitally, you know, um, 
I a couple of places that I I really like to be. One is I have enjoyed these voice only apps. Um, and I'm in Clubhouse, which is this like kind of t- sceny like beta app um, where you know a bunch of different people are in there and they can p- open up a room and then just have a conversation. And and I, I don't know if Clubhouse is going to get it exactly right, but I think there's something interesting about that about about conversation about like live conversation that's not video or photo based. I think that's interesting. Um, is it is it high quality enough? Because um, I was discussing with um, another person who who was a lucky one to get an invite to the to the club as well, and and he said that uh, he doesn't feel like listening to that. It's so low density mm. in the sense of you know the quality. So you're sort of spending your time, and obviously you cannot just uh, double speed or triple speed to discuss. Yeah. yeah, I think that's one of the tensions is is in uh in right now they're getting more professors in there and musicians who are playing in clubhouse and people who are hosting conversations about topics that they're really well versed in with people they've selected to come in and so i i sort of feel like i'm able to listen in on you know three professors from two different from from different universities around the world and maybe some practitioners all together in the same place. Like the other night I was listening to a woman, an economist, interviewed two of the so leading like social scientists, psycho- psychological scientists um, who were talking about social media and kind of in re- response to the this film, The Social Dilemma that I was in. And I was in the audience and so was Clubhouse's founder. And these professors were able to ask the founder questions that they had. And I, I just realized I always feel like that one of the big challenges that we have is that people who are doing the deepest thinking about the world, academics and fellows, are often really physically separated and not able to have casual conversations from people who are doing the building. And then it was happening there on Clubhouse. And I, I thought that was really cool. So I think sometimes there are really high quality conversations and sometimes they're extremely casual ones. And you kind of pop in and out and just like bail on things that you don't want to be in. Um, but one of the tensions I think is feeling like you aren't just there to listen to like famous people. What if if the quality is going to be good? Maybe you're just there to like always be in the audience and 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 not participate. It's almost like too intimidating. Versus when the quality is low, maybe you can participate as a as a regular person, but maybe you don't feel like the content is super interesting. But I, I just Sounds like a new TED talk. Yeah, exactly. That that is, I think, the closest. I think it is it is like taking the experience of what I've heard the early TED conferences were like online, just in terms of a, a lot of different, really interesting people. But it, it's kind of like exclusive too, right? Like it's sort of like exclusionary. Like not anyone can get in there, and you have to get like an invite and all that kind of stuff. And I think I think when when it, it when those kinds of businesses or platforms try to try to grow, it, it doesn't always the model doesn't always hold. Um, you know that that you feel like you're always having a special conversation when you're just kind of getting put in with a stranger on the internet who you don't have context about. So I, I wonder about that, but I do think these like voice apps feel live and dynamic. But because you're not in there with your photo or your video, it doesn't feel so image based or sort of like about about my my body or how I look. And and I appreciate that, but. You, know, you can also do other stuff. I, I did an episode in the summer uh, with uh, Tom Maya uh, from Voice Hub. That's the European clubhouse. Mm, cool. And we were we were talking about you know about voice, and we were even or maybe it was me who was phrasing it as like a decade of audio because there's so much stuff. But one of the cool things is that you can actually do other stuff because you don't you know the video is not on. Yeah. And, and you can you can really chat and talk and and you know that way jump in when you need and, and otherwise just, you know, make the excellent espresso or something. Yeah. And I think people are kind of sick of looking at their screens, you know, and, and to be able to just have your phone be there and kind of go about and and do whatever you want to do while also learning and interacting is, is really nice right now, especially during like the pandemic. But I, what, a couple other platforms that I'll shout out that I'm, I'm in and that I'm excited about one of them is in beta right now, but you can download it, and it's called Beams, uh, and it's a, it's it's developed by a bunch of different Europeans, and the product is a list a list product, and so you can 
go kind of like break a, a story or a list of things or recommendations or a recipe into picture and text, picture and text, pe- text, picture and text. And if I want to share it with you, I want to share my favorite restaurants in New York City, or I want to document uh, my favorite surf spots in New York or a recipe that I just cooked. It allows me to just make a list that I keep forever and I can share and send to to someone that wants to see that, wants to see something I know a lot about or I care a lot about. And So it's like a four square meets notes. Yeah, sort of, sort of. And it's almost like to maybe like a Pinterest that you make yourself, except it's it's kind of linear. And I just get excited about that space because I think if you make a list or you break down the process of building something, you're talking about something that you experienced that you really loved and and you're really passionate about and you want to share that experience or that knowledge with someone else. And I find that people are most lit up and kind of the best version of themselves in, in terms of their social interactions. And they're talking about their passions. They're talking about things that they experienced or that they know a lot about or they care a lot about. And I think the format does a good job of pulling that information out of people. So I, I'm excited about that. Um, and we'll see where that goes. And then the final thing that I'll, I'll mention, which is kind of fun and and um, a little bit like radical, is that one of my good friends who is an early engineer at Instagram has built uh, a, a, an app called Untitled. And it's not publicly available, but it is old Instagram. So it's it's Instagram without an algorithm. And it's just the feed and photos and uh, a user curated discover page. And he made it just because he missed this old format and he wanted to be able to see what his friends were up to and see creative things in the world. And to have this version of Instagram that was made intentionally for my small group of friends that we get to use to see each other's lives that don't have business in- major business incentives or uh, an ad model or like this pressure of fame or like posting too much is, you know, and curating the hell out of what you post is awesome. And I'm like so happy with it. Like if I, if I just had this, I would be totally content with, with seeing the people I cared about's lives and the people that I, I just don't know by, by one degree of separation. So I think, I think there's a lot that's going to happen in the next three to five years and we'll see how, how long those businesses survive. Cause I feel like the market is dominated by some extremely wealthy, big players that tend to just buy the small guys. But I, I think we'll be delighted and surprised by, by a lot of things that come out in the next five to seven years. You mentioned uh, passion. Uh, it's basically, you know, we, it's, it's all around us nowadays. And uh, this is something I've been thinking because there's everything is about passion economy, more or less. Uh, and, and, you know, you should consume things where you deeply care about, you know, the brand or you, you know the, what's happening there and you connect. Is this basically where everything is leading? You should be conscious of whatever you consume, whatever you do, and, and should be passionate about those things. Is, is, is that getting a bit more, you know, too much as well? Can I just be a bit a stupid, uh, stupid chompy sometime and, and just not be too passionate about everything? Or is this the direction we're going? I think that's a great question. And it feels like a very realist European thing to say to, to Amer- an American. <laughs> So I think I think that yes, you're totally right, um, and I think that there is a lot of that though. Like in in my opinion, I think you know when I see the content on TikTok, it's like there's a lot of like goofy, funny, dumb. I'm gonna say shit. There's a lot of goofy, funny, dumb shit on the internet that you know I can watch a dog skateboarding down the street and just be like, wow, that's funny. It's not my passion. <laughs> like that's that's funny. So I I think there's like a world out there for both of those things. I think in terms of like the stuff that you share um, with total strangers, I just see that as like a a pretty good connective thread between people. Like when you're trying to kind of acquaint yourself. So if you can find with another stranger, some, whenever I find out someone's a surfer, I, I love to surf. It's just like, I can just get to another level with them instead of just being like, oh, where are you from? Where do you work? And and so I think kind of helping people connect over things that they know a lot about or they give a damn about allows people who have no other context for each other to go a little deeper. So that's why I get excited about it. But I, I totally agree 
with you that not everything has to be in that orientation. How do you find people who love hedgehogs? Oh, great question. Um, <laughs> well, the easiest way... Don't say you came to the Instagram because of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, there's a lot of great ways. And I, I am a person that loves hedgehogs. So let me let me tell you about that. But um, the the thing that I think is is great about the internet is if someone is really into hedgehogs, maybe they post a lot of photos of hedgehogs. They follow also a lot of hedgehogs. So depending on, you know, what where, whatever platform you're on where there's a follower model, if you find one person who loves surfing or loves shih tzus or is really into latte art, if you if they're creating that content, they 100% are following people who are also like them. And so you can kind of go through these individually curated almost rabbit holes for sure. Um, but then I don't know. Yeah. Google still does a pretty good job. Like I, I am a hedgehog obsessed person and I was in Japan in January before the whole world shut down. And there are all these hedgehog cafes where you can walk in and hold hedgehogs and get your picture taken. And, you know, even in another wow. country, I can just like put that, I'm like hedgehog Tokyo. <laughs> they come up. So it, it's not too hard to just kind of like start find the tip of the iceberg and then it's your job just to burrow in through different I think follower graphs is is one great way. Are there cafes like that in in you know New York? You know, I this this is going to reveal how much I know about hedgehogs. Um I my my permanent residence in the United States has been in New York and California and those two states outlaw hedgehogs because they are carriers of foot and mouth disease. So They're not here, and if they are here, they're illegal, and I would love to know about them. And if anyone wants to drop me that tip, please let me know. <laughs> Am I in trouble now? You know, <laughs> if you're listening and you that have a hedgehog, that was clever. Package. You know, you you <laughs> <laughs> putting it out in my show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please, please pass a line through uh, through s- Signal or uh, Telegram, and and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately i guess you are not in a social media so you're hard to find i am i'm on twitter you can totally dm me on twitter i, I leave that up for sure <laughs> what is your favorite word um right now my favorite word is pepperonis pepperonis it's a great word what is your least favorite word um i think the first thing that comes to mind is stupid Um, I don't like the way it sounds and I don't like people who call other people stupid. I think it's, it's an empty word. It's like a cruel, empty word. What turns you on creatively, spiritually or emotionally? Conversations with other humans, eye contact, people who are good listeners, trying to be a good listener, creating something new through conversation with another person. What turns you off? I think ego or I don't know if ego is the right word, um, but ungenerous motivations. Uh, yeah. What is your favorite curse word? Hmm. What is my... Probably bugger. Bugger. <laughs> Especially the way the English say it, which might be like a super horrible word. I'm sorry. That's a great, great one, though. Is this becoming a trend? All the Americans I'm interviewing, they're they're just speaking the British words. Is it more fancy? Oh my god! Yeah, we've been we've just been totally uh, propagandized that Engl- British British English is is beautiful and and appealing. So 100%, I, I fell to that. What sound or noise do you love? I grew up in California, in Northern California, and there's a sound of like ruffling eucalyptus leaves and like the forest leaves that um, when the wind would go through them that I think is is very soothing for me. What sound or noise do you hate? Oh, man, living in New York, if you are driving and the light turns green and you are not like already moving your car right when the light turns green, you get honked at. It's almost laughable, but just like the like pushing you to be faster honk, it's uh, totally unnecessary. And New York like just drives me totally crazy. 
what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I would have loved to have been a sportscaster for sure. I, I like feel like I would have had a ton of fun doing that, like live interviewing athletes or calling games. I, I would have loved to have done that. I love sports and I just, I, I have a lot of fun being live and dynamic with people on, on a microphone. So I would have loved that. Are you sure you don't have a Twitch account? <laughs> I should get one. That's a good idea. That's a genius idea. Excuse me. I need to go do that right now. <laughs> what profession uh, would you not like to do? You know, a, a lot of people in tech land like love software engineers. They're kind of like the kings of the castle. But the actual lived experience of sitting on my ass in front of a computer with a console open, like cranking Red Bulls and listening to techno, like techno music or whatever to stay in a flow state. I think I would, I would hate that and would not be my thing. If you could be a co-founder of any startup mm-hmm. in any era, which one would you choose? That is a fun question. Um, I, it's hard to know that I'm, I've truly canvassed the options, but um you know, one company that I really respect is This American Life, the the radio show, which is really big in in the United States, and they make this de- deceptively simple, you know, hour long radio show that is so high quality, and they only need like twenty people to do it, and people who know it love it. They just like just gush about it, and people who don't know about it don't know about it. And it's a healthy small business that's just extremely well respected. So I think something like that, um, where it, it's not too complicated to run. You just do one thing and you do it really well, and and people really really appreciate it. Any final words for the audience? Mm. Yeah, I, I think the final words are the the big thesis of that we got from. Um, all the communities that we met who we were really impressed by, who were thriving and and benevolent, successful communities of all kinds, which is you build a community with people, not for them. And I think with the internet and the tools that we have today, it's so much easier to communicate with, empower, (laughs) um, find and connect to other people who are passionate about something that you're passionate about. But the orientation is different than what we've had for a long time, which is to build for others. And it's really powerful to empower other people instead of just try to do everything for them. So yeah, consider how you can be more progressively collaborative with other people in your life and, and empower people instead of kind of control or manage and, and, and define the relationship with other people. Thank you, Paley. I think you just solved the social dilemma. <laughs> I hope so. Good Lord, that would be a hell of an accomplishment. You heard it here, people. Somewhere on my Wikipedia page where we're going to say that I solved this. I need a Wikipedia page first. <laughs> well, we can fix that, I guess, audience. You know, everybody can <laughs> contribute a bit, you know, do it Thank with you. us, you know. <laughs> yes. But Bailey, we need, may need something from you as well. You know, how about some club uh, invites? Oh, yeah. God, I need to earn them. <laughs> It's amazing. They only give them to you if you spend a lot of time in the app. And so I think... But can you just open the app? And I could. That's a great the- idea. There you go. Problem solved. I can do that. All right. Yeah. Thank you for the invite you sent me. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for listening and hope you enjoyed. Who's your favorite entrepreneur? Who would you like to hear in the show? Send me your ideas. Who's that one friend who needs to hear about this episode? Tip them. Talk to you soon.